Redemption uh, draweth nigh, and in the meantime, we want to just keep preaching, keep praying, uh, keep living for the Lord, even in these last days that we're in. And so if you look with me at Colossians chapter number 2, uh, Colossians chapter number 2, once again, we continue in our study here at Grace Baptist Church on Sunday mornings uh, in, in the book of Colossians, Paul's letter to the Colossians. We've been going verse by verse, and so we'll just uh, keep going uh, as the Lord leads here. Let's pick up in verse 16. That's where we're at today, verse number 16. We're going to go ahead and look from verse 16 down through verse 23 at the close of the chapter, and so we'll be finishing up uh, chapter 2 this morning. I want us to think here about some instructions for the body. Instructions for the body. And, and by that, I mean instructions for the church, the body of Christ. I think that's what Paul the Apostle is, is, uh, is, is saying here. And so let's pick up with verse 16, where the Bible says, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, and not holding the head, from which all the body by joints and bands, having nourishment, ministered, and knit together, increaseth with the increase of God. Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, are ye subject to ordinances, Touch not, taste not, handle not, which all are to perish with the using after the commandments and doctrines of men, which things have indeed a show of wisdom in will, in, in will worship, and humility, and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying uh, of the flesh. Let's pray together. Lord, we do thank you for the reading of the word of God this morning. We ask now that you would speak to our hearts through the preaching of your word and by the presence of your Holy Spirit. Draw us closer to yourself that we might learn more of you, that we might be better equipped to serve you. And Lord, we'll thank you for all you do. In Jesus' precious name, we humbly pray. Amen and amen. Thank you. May be seated. Uh, here in Colossians chapter number two, let me remind you of some of the things we've been thinking about. How that Paul really appears to be concerned about some errors uh, that were that had endangered uh, the Colossian church, and these are errors that are still a danger for us today. And, and he deals with this, I believe, in this chapter, and he gives an answer to such errors. And in doing so, he points us directly to Jesus. Amen. Tells us that Jesus is the answer. Back in verse 10, your memory says, and ye are complete in him. It's so good to know that in our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, we do have the answer uh, against such errors and things that, that may confront us today. And so we're complete in him. And then verses 13 through 15, his focus is on the cross. Once we get our minds on Jesus and understanding he's the answer, well, he's the answer, of course, because of what happened at the cross. 
where Jesus uh, was, was nailed to that cross and where his precious blood was shed and, and where the promise of eternal life is, has been made for all who believe and trust in him because he was our sacrifice for our sins and our substitute on that cross. And he paid the price, not for any sins for himself, he paid, he paid the price for my sins and for your sins. And so that focus has got to be on the cross. And the Apostle Paul and all of his preaching and all of his writing, uh, we can definitely say that his focus was always on the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. I remind you how he said in uh, Galatians chapter 6 and verse 14, But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. Everything is about the cross. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us it is unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. I believe his whole ministry and his whole preaching was on the cross. And really, ours need to be uh, as well. Amen. But now he turns in verse number 16 and through the close of the chapter, and he begins another focus here. He's, he's, put it, he's pointed us directly to Jesus, Back in verse 10, you're complete in him. He, he's placed our focus upon the cross. Now the primary focus appears to be on the church or on the body of Christ. And I think it's in a good sequence, a good order there. Once you've got, once your focus, listen, once you're, once you're established upon uh, the Lord Jesus Christ and what we have in him and focused on his cross and what happened at that cross and what he did for us, then, then right on the heels of that comes us. It comes the body of Christ. And so there's a focus on the church here. And from verse 16 down through verse 23, I call this some instructions for the body. Instructions for the body of Christ. Instructions for the church. And in giving this, you'll notice that he deals with uh, primarily three specific errors. Three specific errors that, that uh, was an endanger to the church in, in Colossae and is still a danger for the church today, a danger for us still today. And so I want us to look at these three errors. The first one is the error of legalism. The error of legalism. Uh, Paul, I believe, gives us instruction on this. Verse 16 and verse 17. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or, or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Do you see that in verse 17? A shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Here is the error, really, of legalism. And it was a great error in Paul's day. Because you see, the problem was with uh, a group of people known as the Judaizers. And what the Judaizers would do is they would follow really around the Apostle Paul. They were Jews that, that did claim to uh, believe on Jesus as their Messiah. They believed his death on the cross as the payment for sin. They believed in his resurrection. That They believed on Jesus. Uh, very likely they confessed Jesus Christ uh, as their Savior. But the thing that they thought was that when Paul on his missionary journeys would go and preach uh, salvation by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and, and by God's grace alone, uh, they had a problem with that. And so they would follow Paul and they would go to places and they would tell the, the Gentiles, they would go to these Gentile churches, these Jews would, they would go to these Gentile churches, these Gentile believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, and they would tell them something like, you know, Paul is right about trusting Jesus Christ as your Savior, but you need to know something. Your salvation depends on more than that. They, said it depend they would say that you can't be saved unless you trust Christ and also become a Jew. They believed you had to mix it together. They believed that the Gentiles had to get circumcised. They believe the Gentiles had to uh, worship on the Sabbath day or on Saturday. Uh, they believe that they had to uh, uh, follow the Jewish dietary laws. 
about meat and drink and so forth. They believed they had to follow after the Jewish uh, holy days and the new moons and Sabbath days and the various feasts and so forth. In other words, they had to trust Christ as their Savior, but they had to practice the Jewish religion in, in a combination with it as well to have a real Christianity. And this was an error. It was an error of legalism. And, and, and I think the Apostle Paul is making it clear here in two ways. For one thing about these people, the Judaizer, they had a wrong view of salvation. Their view of salvation was absolutely wrong. In verse number 16 again, let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink. You notice it mentions the respect of the holy days, new moon, and Sabbath days. You see, if you understand this, you understand that, that their view of salvation or their salvation that they claimed was a salvation of works. Can you say amen to that? They, they, they have Jesus in there, but they have all this other. It's a salvation of works. And the thing is, there's a lot of people. We still have that error in our generation today. There's a lot of people today that still follow this same error in regards to their view of salvation. But the New Testament has made it very clear that salvation is not of works at all, but that salvation is all of the grace of God. Amen. Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. How do we not understand that statement? It's not of works, period. <laughs> it's just not of works. And so they were wrong in their view of salvation here. And if you remember Romans chapter number 3, Romans chapter number uh, 3 and um, uh, verse, uh, verse 23, Romans chapter 3, verse 23, you know the verse, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But then notice the following verses, verse 24, being justified freely, how? By his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness that he might be just and the, watch the words here, and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Nowhere does it say that God is the justifier of him that believes in Jesus and practices the Jewish religion. You know, that's not in the scriptures anywhere at all. And you can't make it to have any kind of truth to it at all. They had a wrong view of salvation. And there are a lot of people. Uh, there's a lot of people in that day. There's a lot of people in this day. And, and, and think about the people in, in the day when Jesus uh, was upon this earth and what he said in Matthew chapter number 7. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 down through verse 23, he said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name have done, uh, done many wonderful works? Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Jesus said it's not everyone that just says Lord and then does all this other religious stuff along with it and they're depending upon those works. They're depending upon that religion. He, he says that these people, uh, that they, they will are, are not going to enter into the kingdom of heaven. The only ones that enter in the kingdom of heaven are the ones that do the will of my Father which is in heaven. And what is the will of, of God the Father which is in heaven? His will is that we believe on and we trust in and we accept Jesus Christ and God's grace by faith in order to be saved. Amen. It's not His will that we add all these other things that the Judaizers were trying to get the Gentile believers uh, to do. They were causing a lot of confusion uh, in the churches that had been started as a result of the Apostle Paul's missionary journeys because they had a wrong view of salvation. That's the problem of legalism. That's the error of legalism. Now let's understand this. I'll give you just kind of a side note here for us to really have it clear in our thinking. Legalism applies, the term legalism applies uh, specifically, I believe, to our view of salvation. 
we, we, the Bible does teach that we should have uh, some standards. And I think we should all say amen to that. And there are those who say that, well, if you have a standard about, about how you dress, about where you go, about the things that you do, and, and you, have, you have a standard in your life uh, that you are living out uh, because you want to be right with God, you want to be uh, pleasing uh, to the Lord as you serve the one that you put your faith and trust in uh, uh, as Savior and Lord of your life. And there will be those who will shout legalism. They'll say legalism. You preach this standard or that one or another. They'll say legalism. The, th the problem with that is this. Legalism doesn't, is not applied to standards, biblical standards in the Christian life. Legalism refers to the view of salvation. A legalist is someone that will preach and believe that you have to do these certain things in order to really be saved. And we don't believe that. We don't believe that, that we uh, have our standards and we seek to live by our standards because it's living by the standards that, we're, that we have our salvation. We don't believe that at all. We believe we have some standards because we want to be pleasing to the Lord who has saved us. Amen? And so understand where legalism, the term, should be applied. It all is about salvation, a wrong view of salvation. But I think it's also a wrong view of the church. The error of legalism has a wrong view of the church or the body of Christ. You'll notice in verse number 17 where the apostle writes, which are a shadow of things to come. Now what's he talking about when he says which? He's referring to those things that he mentioned there, verse 16, uh, meat, drink, uh, the holy days, the new moon, Sabbath day. He says which, you know, these things are a shadow of things to come, but the body, and the body is the church, amen? The body is of Christ. They had a wrong view of the church. Their uh, wrong view of salvation led them to a wrong view of the church. They seem to have thought, I'm talking about the Judaizers now, uh, they seem to have thought that the church uh, was an extension of their religion. But their religion, according to what the Apostle Paul writes here, was a shadow of things to come. He says that's what it was. That, that's the purpose of it. It's a shadow of things to come. Now, now, now get this. Much of the Old Testament laws and rituals uh, were examples or illustrations of what Christ would do uh, and what Christ would be for us as sinners. What he would do when he would come to this earth. In other words, it, it is given and is meant to point our, our thoughts and our direction towards, uh, towards Christ. Uh, that's what it's about. And since he has come, since Jesus Christ has come to the world, and since he has gone to the cross of Calvary, and since he has died and was buried and rose again the third day, he's ascended back to heaven, and we have his promise that he's coming back, back again. Since he has come, uh, listen, the, 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 the symbols, the rituals, the illustrations, all those things that would point to him, we don't have need of those again. Amen? We don't, we don't have need of those when it comes to the church, when it comes to salvation. Let's look at, at some of this in, in Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 8. And I could read a lot, but for sake of time, I'll just kind of limit a little bit uh, what we'll look at. I would encourage you to go back and read uh, Hebrews chapter 8 and chapter 9 and chapter 10 and, and study this. Uh, Hebrews chapter number uh, 8. And um, let me just pick up with verse number uh Five. Well, I'll get it kind of in a context to start with verse 1, if you're following along there. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1. Now the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. That's Jesus. A minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. Wherefore, it is a necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that uh, there are priests that offer gifts according to the law. 
who, now watch this, verse 5, who serve unto the example. You see that word? The example and shadow of heavenly things. As Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle, for see, saith he, uh, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee on the mount. And then verse 6, But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which is established upon better promises. Now what is that better covenant that the Lord Jesus Christ and the better promises that he's established for us? Look over to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter number 10. And uh, let me pick up verse 24 of chapter 9 also. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 24. For Christ is not entered into the holy place made, made with hands, which are the figures of the truth, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. Jesus does not go into a tabernacle or temple or holy place here on the earth as the Jewish priests would do that we read of in the Old Testament and then in the New Testament in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. No, Jesus, he, his sacrifice has been presented before God in heaven. Jesus has appeared before God in heaven. And so why is that? We'll look at chapter 10 now. Uh, Hebrews 10 verse 1. For the law having a shadow of good things to come. And not the very image of the things can never. Now here's the key here. Can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect or complete. He says for then they would, uh, they, uh, would they not have ceased to be offered? because that the worshipers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices, talking about the Old Testament law, the Jewish uh, practices, but in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared uh, me. Burn offerings and, and sacrifices, for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. O God, this is talking about what Jesus did when he came and when he went to the cross. He says, Above when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither hadst pleasure therein which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. Watch this. He taketh away the first that he may establish the second. By the which, that is by the second, by the which will we, uh, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Those things that the Judaizers were trying to get the Gentile churches to do, they're trying to get them to be circumcised, trying to get them to have di the dietary laws trying to get them to observe the Sabbath days, the holy days, the new moons, the feasts, and all of these things that, that they had and they practiced. And they said, you've got to accept Jesus, but you've got to become a Jew. You've got to do all these other things as well. My friend, they had a wrong view of salvation, a wrong view of the church. It's the error of legalism. And in their view of the church, the Apostle Paul now says in our text in Colossians chapter number 2, verse 17, but the body is of Christ. And so understand this this morning. The church, I'm about the body of Christ today, the church is not a combination of the old and the new. It is in Jesus Christ alone. Amen. As Jesus said in John 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. And so you see that era of legalism, wrong view of salvation, wrong view of the church. And then there's the era of mysticism, the era of mysticism. That was a problem as well to the uh, Colossian church. Let's notice verse 18, verse 19 in Colossians chapter 2. Let no man beguile you of your reward in, in, a, in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. That's a key to understanding 
the error there is it's of his flat of man's fleshly mind and not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands having nourishment ministered and knit together increaseth with the increase of God. And so you've got the error of mysticism. And so think about this together. Just, just as much as it is wrong to try to mix Judaism with Christianity, it is also wrong to mix paganism with Christianity as well. Amen? It's wrong to mix it. And people try to do that today. Verse 16 where it says, let, let no man therefore judge you. And, and when he's talking about in, the, in these things, and, and so in other words, the thing is, uh, Jesus Christ paid for all of our sins. Can you say amen to that? And we are saved by his grace. And, and so what Paul is telling the Colossian church here in, in, in response to the error that the Judaizers would bring their way, Paul is saying here, look, don't be intimidated by them. And don't be intimidated either by the legalistic stipulations or by pagan rituals. Remember, they're in the Gentile culture, the Gentile uh, society. And a lot of paganism, a lot of idolatry there. Both were threats to the Colossian church. Uh, legalism and, and uh, Judaism and paganism. Both were threats to the church because of the Judaizers on the one hand and then the pagan philosophers on the other. The same dangers confront us today. So how do we respond to that? How do we answer? Well, notice verse 18. In verse 18, I think what we need to do is simply this. Don't yield to the critics. Don't yield to the critics. He said, let no man beguile you of your reward and that, now that word beguile, it can mean to, uh, to defraud or to, or to you know, take away from or to remove. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. Here, the Apostle Paul is warning against false teachers. And he's saying really, I think this, don't let them take away your joy in serving the Lord Jesus Christ by their false humility and by their wrong worship. Don't let them talk you into this thing that, well, if you're going to be really right with God, you, you got to get into all this other stuff as well. Uh, but the thing about it is, understand this, angels are not to be worshipped. Can you say amen to that? Idols are not to be worshipped. Uh, and, and can I just go ahead and throw this in? Mary is not to be worshipped. Uh, it is an error. It's an error of mysticism. God alone is to be worshipped, and Jesus alone is to be praised. Amen. Psalm 148. Psalm 148. Let me read this for you uh, just a little bit here. Praise you. Now watch this. Psalm 148, verse 1 and following. Praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the Lord from the heavens. Praise Him in the heights. And then listen to what the Bible says here. Praise ye him, all his angels. Praise ye him, all his hosts. Praise ye him, sun and moon. Uh, praise him, all ye stars of light. Praise him, ye heavens of heavens and ye waters above the heavens. Look, we are not to praise angels. Angels are to praise the Lord. Amen. And we are not to praise the sun and the moon and the stars, but the sun and the moon and the stars and, and the heavens itself, the Bible says, they give praise unto the Lord. They praise God and they praise our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, it is an error of mysticism. Uh, we are not to worship or to praise uh, such things. We worship and praise our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ alone. Amen. It's all in Him. So don't yield to the critics that try to criticize you and try to take away your joy and, and say that, you know, you're, you're, you're really following something wrong. No, we're, we're worshiping the one and only God and we just don't need to yield to uh, such critics or criticism. Uh, we need to yield to Christ. Number two, amen, yield to Christ. Verse number 19, and verse 19, uh, and not holding. Now this was a problem with those that were involved in this mysticism, worshiping uh, the angels and the idols and so forth. It says, and not holding the head, 
from which all the body uh, by joints and bands have, having nourishment, ministered and knit together, increases with the increase of God. Their mistake was they would worship all these other things and they'd say that, well, you need to be uh, doing this and this error and this problem of, of mysticism, but they would not hold the head, which is Jesus Christ. Remember, we're talking about the body, talking about the church and talking about instructions for the church. Understand this, Jesus Christ is the head of the body. He's the head of the church, amen? And we are members of his body, and so thus we should look to him. We don't look to the stars and the heavens and the angels or the idols. We look to him, amen, because he is the head. Colossians chapter 1, you remember this? Verse 15, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things are created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Listen, and he is the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence, for it pleased the Father, that in him should all fullness dwell. He is who we look to, amen, to worship and to praise. We yield to him. And then, then in that verse in Colossians 2 verse 19, you notice uh, that phrase there at the end of the verse where it talks about being, uh, of course, being knit together, joined together with the head, the Lord Jesus Christ. And other, he's the head of the body. He's the head of the church. And then, it, and then it says, increaseth with the increase of God. I don't know about you, but I, I like that. That sounds good to me. Increase it. That is when we are when we hold to the head, when we're joined to the head, when we're joined to the Lord Jesus Christ, then 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 we have that in we can increase with the increase of God. In other words, it's simply this spiritual growth and blessings uh, that only God gives, and He only gives it through Jesus Christ. Amen. 2 Peter 3, 18, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 12, you remember, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable uh, service. You see, our thing is, we're not to yield to uh, those that would criticize. We don't yield to those that follow after this mysticism. No, we yield to the Lord Jesus Christ because He alone is the head of the body. He's the head of the church. And you see, they miss that. They say, well, you worship all these other things. And so the era of legalism followed by the error of mysticism, but then also the Apostle Paul deals with the error of asceticism. The error of asceticism from verse 20 down through verse 23. And by that, what, we, what, what, what is meant is this. Asceticism is, is, is what is the practice, a uh, definition, the practice of strict self-denial as a measure of personal and especially spiritual discipline. In, in other words, it's described there in such practice. And I just give you two things that are a problem with this. One is that, that it, it only involves the, the, the uh, false doctrines of men. It's the false doctrines of men, this practice of asceticism. Notice verse 20, verse 21, verse 22. Wherefore, if he be dead with Christ, from the rudiments of the world. Why? As though living in the world are ye subject to ordinances, and, and then he gives a list here, touch not, taste not, handle not, which all are to perish with the using after the commandments and doctrines of men. You see, it's the false doctrines of men that say that, well, to really be right spiritually, uh, you, you've got to you, you've got to have strict discipline and, and, and you just touch not, you taste not, uh, you handle not. That's that error of, of uh, asceticism and all of these things. Here's the problem. All of these things are man-made, amen? There's nothing biblical or scriptural about them at all. All of them are man-made 
and and they are a very much the the really the vital part or the essence of false religions and cults today such as hinduism and islam and roman catholicism would be in that category as well uh false doctrines of men you see you see the things where they you know you've got to do things that that even things that that physically would harm you physically would hurt you but you strive to do such things in order to be closer to god that's an error being close to god does not involve things like this it's the error of asceticism the false doctrines of men but it's also a problem of it is there it, it's the failure to honor god when people get involved in these things it's it's a, the failure to honor god notice in verse 23 which things have indeed a show of wisdom in, in will, worship, and humility, and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. In other words, think of it like this. What Paul is saying here is these are things that really don't honor God. All they do is satisfy the flesh. They give you some idea that when you practice such things that that, that you can gain a reputation for holiness. And these are things like maybe some of the pictures you see of the, uh, of the uh, Hindu people and the, like in the nation of, of India where they, where they uh, uh, lay down on the bed of nails, where they walk across the burning coals and they do all these things. And all these people gather around them and they marvel at them. They say, boy, that's a, that's a spiritual man. That's a great man that, that, that would do these things. What Paul the Apostle is saying here simply is this. These things do not honor God. All they do, and, and really the, about the only thing, the uh, best thing they can do, uh, they just give you some kind of reputation. And people think of you as a holy man. I can think of other things to think of man, like a crazy man, amen. Not a holy man. But that's, that's a problem. It's a problem in our society, in our world today. Now notice the phrase there where he says, he says that these things have indeed a show of wisdom in, in, in their worship, their humility, their activity, you know, all things that they do. He says it's a show of wisdom. Understand the meaning of that is simply that it has an appearance and that that's all that it is. It is an appearance. Does that remind you of something? Because in these last days, that you and I are living in right now, we're, seeing, we're going to see more and more of these things. In uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3, the Apostle Paul writes, This know also, verse 1, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lover of pleasures, more than lovers of God. And, and then don't miss this, verse 5, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. And Paul told Timothy, from such turn away. A form of godliness, some type of aesthetic ritual and practice that, that, that makes a man look like someone so great. Uh, the Apostle Paul in the Bible here says that's really, that's all it is. There's no power in it. And the reason there's no power in it is because it fails to honor God. None of these things honor God. All they do is Put some kind of picture or reputation on the person. God is nowhere near such things. And I think that's why Paul told Timothy from such turn away. God's not in that. The interesting thing is that Paul writes it to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and says it's in the last days. These are the times. These are the things that are going to be happening. This is the way men are going to be behaving. These are the things they're going to be doing. And there's going to be a tremendous growth 
and, and all of this. All of these things there is. Uh, I uh, probably shouldn't take the time. I, I'll just mention to it very, very, uh, uh, try to mention to you very briefly. But we're seeing such things happening today among people who were in Baptist churches. We're seeing mysticism really on, on the rise. We're seeing this thing of asceticism. There is a thing, I've been reading the articles for really over the past couple of years now and seeing some reports, but there is a movement in particular among Southern Baptists to practice a, 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 a Roman Catholic uh, uh, practice of meditation. And there's some big name teachers and preachers and so forth that are promoting uh, this thing. There is in particular some uh, uh, professors at some of the Southern Baptist seminaries that have promoted uh, such things. The problem is none of that is of God. None of it uh, is of God. Well, I could tell you some things that just curl your skin and uh, that have read that someone, who, uh, a particular woman who was a professor at a Southern Baptist college and the things that she's written and been teaching about, about, about a woman needing to worship herself and that, and that yourself is, is, is a goddess, the goddess of yourself and teaching such stuff in a Baptist seminary. And all of this, we're seeing a rise of it today. And so that is fulfilling what Paul told Timothy, the last days, the perilous times, that's the way people are going to be acting and behaving. And so he deals with these errors, legalism, mysticism, asceticism. But what's the answer to all this? I give it to you in verse number 20, very brief, very quickly. The essence, the instructions to the body of Christ, the church, understand this, that the essence of Christianity, what Christianity really is about, Christianity is not Jesus and then uh, practicing the Jewish holy days and feasts and new moons and Sabbaths and, and Gentiles being circumcised and all of these things, the dietary laws. It's not Jesus and those things together. And, and then the, the real essence of Christianity is not the mysticism and the asceticism either. But the real essence of Christianity is that our salvation is in Jesus Christ alone. Verse 20, you'll notice he says, Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ, amen, period. If ye be dead with Christ, you don't need this other stuff. The real essence of Christianity is that our salvation is in Christ alone. Uh, that, that our life is in Christ alone. And that to be saved means that you have been made alive in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Look at Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. For Christ sitteth in the, on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. You see, Paul is making it clear for us to realize as a church, church, we don't, we don't add these errors. We don't, we don't follow any of these other things. Our faith, our salvation, our life, it is all in Jesus Christ because in Jesus we are absolutely dead to this world and dead to ourselves. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1, and you have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Paul the apostle in Galatians chapter 2 verse 20, for I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me in the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It's all in Jesus. Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3 verse number 5. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. What is that washing of regeneration? What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Amen. What, what is that renewing of the Holy Ghost? Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto, you, unto 
thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Marvel not that I said unto, ye, uh, unto thee, ye must be born again. That's where it's at, church. It's not by any of this other stuff that men try to add to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul says it's none of that. It is of God's mercy and it is of God's grace and it is faith in Jesus Christ alone upon which our salvation is, is founded and upon which our life is to be based upon. It all goes back to him. Do you see that? Amen. So I go back to say this one thing once again. Jesus is the answer. <laughs> of all the errors, all the false teaching, all the idolatry, all, all, the, all the things that people get confused with, even still in our world today. You say, what is the answer? Jesus. You say that sounds simple. It is simple, but it is true. Jesus Christ is the answer. And to know God, to have the forgiveness of your sins, to have salvation, to have the promise of eternal life, then friend, you've got to have Jesus Christ. You've got to have Jesus. And, and I can't help but want to say 